The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said, love you, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you lo love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. God of all grace and tender, fierce mercy, I speak in your name and in your presence, asking that my words would be pleasing to you, guided by your spirit, and that the hearts and minds of your people would be open to you. Through Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. Well, blessed Independence Day to you. So, if my uh, add-ons and takeaways are right, we celebrate our 245th anniversary of the founding of our nation today. And we do that in the context of our faith, in the context of our life in the church, and our readings for me, the these are the readings selected by the lectionary for, for Independence Day, and I think they're terrific readings for us, and they help us. They help us ground the vision for our nation, ground it in the vision and the mission of the church so that the foundation for us is our faith and our life in God and then our life in our country, and especially as faithful patriots. So, there's a part of me that wants to read the whole Declaration of Independence, but let's not do that. <laughs> let's come to these words that we all know so well. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Almost a century later, Abraham Lincoln gave us these resounding words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Lincoln's words, not just these, but many of his speeches are remarkable. He was just remarkable, uh, lasting words he gave to us. As he worked on this Gettysburg Address, and as he worked on the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln said, the words of the Declaration of Independence are not a social reality, they are an aspiration. They are a vision, they are a hope that we continue to live toward and to live into. 
and for all of us to grasp that in the kingdom of God, Jesus comes and announces the arrival, the good news, I bring the arrival of the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is not complete. We are faithful disciples when we continue to want to grow and to live into the kingdom and let the kingdom grow among us. And so it is with the vision for our nation. We are patriots when we say we are not there yet. We are still aspiring to the great vision of our forefathers in this declaration. It is not unpatriotic to say we're not there yet. In fact, it's perhaps the most patriotic thing we can say, that we're still on our way to this vision, even as we are still on our way to the completion of the arrival of the kingdom of God. And so, all three of our passages, the Old Testament and the epistle and the gospel, I think give us great instruction for how we carry on the mission of Jesus and then how that influences how we carry on the great vision for our country. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I want to just name that and then I want to come back to it. Our Old Testament reading is very interesting. Almost all of it is about God. Hear these words. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them with food and clothing, because this is who God really is. You shall also love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. It places it all in the context of who God is. And Jesus helps us with this in his statement in Matthew's gospel. Be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. Your heavenly Father causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. Your heavenly Father causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. So be like that. Be like God. And be kind and welcoming to the stranger. Now, I want, I want us to go deep with this. Surely there's been a time in your life when you felt like a stranger. No? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Surely there's been a time when you went from one place to another and you felt like a stranger. And, and this text that references that the people were strangers in the land of Egypt, two weeks ago I referenced this story as an archetypal story. It's not just about the people of Israel thousands of years ago, strangers in the land of Egypt. It's about the human experience. And it's about the challenge of being human. It's about the trauma of being human. It's about the upheaval of being human. And it's about being like God that has, um, darn it. What, what, what do I pray with my beginning of my sermon? Fierce, fierce mercies. It's about God having a fierceness. Thank you. It's about God having a fierceness to be merciful to be fierce in being merciful. Starting from your own pain, starting from your own experience of what it feels like to be a stranger and to be an outsider and to not belong and to see that God's mercy sees that about the human situation and invites us to see it too and to respond to the stranger with mercy. Then our text about Abraham leaving the land of his family and going to a place where he did not know where he was going. 
and he had a dream and a vision and a hope, but he didn't know where it was. And Abraham and Sarah took off for a distant land. Have you ever done that? That's even more difficult, I think, than being a stranger. In all the small ways and the big ways. I remember when we moved from Oklahoma to California for me to go to school, and then when we went from California to Arizona for me to come and be here. And, and just everything is different, and everything is strange. But I also remember what it's like in the little ways. You know, to go to a club or a, a club meeting of some kind or a gathering of some kind or a social gathering of some kind and you don't know anybody and you're looking around and trying to figure out what's going on and you're wondering why you're there and you're going, how long do I have to stay? <laughs> that story about Abraham and Sarah is not just a story from thousands and thousands of years ago. It's an archetypal story about what it feels like to be a human being. And the invitation for us, again, is to be fierce in mercy, to welcome the stranger, to realize what it means to go into a distant land or to go to another people and to realize just what it says in the, that text from Deuteronomy, it's so powerful. Well, your God is not partial and urges you to welcome all. Now we get to this text in Matthew, and I don't know, I mean, it's a very interesting text. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. There's a very interesting thing about this. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it say hate your enemy. So this is the sixth of six what's called antitheses in Matthew's gospel, where Jesus will say, you've heard that it was said, but I say. You've heard that it was said, but I say. He says that six times. This is the sixth one. And in this case, he's not... The first part, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, comes from Leviticus. But the second part, hate your enemy, is nowhere found in the Scriptures. And all the commentators I looked at have all kinds of theories about it, but he's not referencing Scripture. And, in fact, there's several times in the Old Testament where it tells people to be kind to their enemy. There's even one wonderful text that says, if your neighbor who hates you, if your neighbor who hates you's mule is burdened down and fallen down because the burden is too heavy, you go help the mule. Lighten the load. There's just nothing like hate your enemy in the Old Testament. Okay, now y'all be with me. Be with me. Don't become defensive. Don't say this is about the other guy. Several commentators I read said, but the reality is this is sort of the way people behave. The reality is we want to put limits on love your neighbor. We want to say, accept those guys. And so it became a sort of common expression that when Jesus said it, everybody would have heard it. But it's not in the scriptures. And Jesus offers a different wisdom and a critique on what was the common way of behaving. It reminds me of, it reminded me of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is that how you know it? Yes? Guess what? That's not what it says. You're going to go look it up? It's Matthew 7, 12. 
That's not what it act. That's not the whole thing that it says. The first word in that saying is all things. All things that you would like for others to do for you, do for them. Hear it again. All things that you want others to do for you, do for them. And in so doing, become the children of God. Become God-like. Let your goodness fall on all. Even as you would like their goodness to fall upon you in all the ways you would like that. Then you will be children of God. Now, in all of this, in, in the way God's described in the Old Testament, and in the way Jesus is describing God here, it has nothing to do with the response. It's about the nature of God. It's not God is doing this to convince people of anything, or God is doing it to win their allegiance. Or, or it's not about that. I mean, that might be a corollary, but that's not what it's about. It's about this is God's nature. Let your nature become like God's nature. To look at the trauma of the human situation as you understand your own trauma and your own pain and your own wounds and your own search and your own uncertainty and your own doubt and your own despair as you understand all of that about yourself and how you so desperately hope someone would show mercy to you. So be like God and radiate mercy to the whole human family. If we see it deeply, the response doesn't matter. And there's an interesting thing about that. Once the response really doesn't matter, we're likely to influence people. We're actually more likely to influence people when our goodness sees Christ in them, sees them as God's beloved and just gives goodness. You ever heard someone say to you, now some of you have heard me do this, so you, you know, it's, it's like a joke, you already know the punchline, but, but, can you change people? Yeah, I love that. No, that's what I, no, you cannot change people. Okay, I thought that my whole life until someone said to me, Jim, pay attention to your impact. How you treat people will influence how they treat you. Can you change their response to you? I think we can. And I'm backing up to what I said a moment ago, but it's not about that. That's not the starting place. The starting place is to let our nature grow more and more Christ-like, more and more God-like, that simply bestows goodness. Watch how it changes the way people respond to us. Realize another saying in the Sermon on the Mount. You will be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so, from our discipleship, from our life in God's kingdom, from our life in God, we become patriots. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let us indeed give ourselves for the growth of that vision. Amen.